we've been doing we found the easiest thing to affect change is in what people eat you know often when you're suggesting supplements or new exercise or download this app and go do this thing that's a layer of work you got to add and it may start off okay but these are the things that people don't comply and drop off you have to eat you're going to eat anyways you might as well do it right and this is where we've understood that if we can affect even that one thing there's so much that can change in terms of health outcomes but what are the right choices Again, genetics do drive part of that. Uh, and there's other sort of golden rules of thumb that are understood. Uh, there's things that we hear in terms of keto diet, paleo diet, et cetera. But what do you actually need to do for yourself? So there's that whole personalization. But before even that, what's available to us? And what's when you go to the grocery store and you're buying whatever you're buying, is that even what you should be buying? Forget about what diet should I be doing. The ingredients that you think you're getting, the food that you think you're putting together to equal that ideal diet for yourself are you actually getting what you think you're getting and this is where big food you hear that a lot there's been big changes food is not what it used to be and so can food alone provide the nutrition we think we need can we affect genetic expression and resolve healthcare issues therapeutically through food like we used to be able to big question mark this is where we have Amar Khawaja joining us today who Ex Wall Street banker, big X. Uh, he pushed himself into a, a very high six figure, almost seven figure salary hitting the street, and then realized he had the wrong goals. Uh, there was something much bigger that he had to resolve, and he walked away. He walked away and said, There's a much bigger problem in this world that I'm going to work on because he himself suffered from the sort of end results of those problems. So, welcome today. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. And you're, you're, uh, it looks like in a camper, van. I am in a camper. Yes. Yeah. Yes, where are you? I am. I am in, uh, just outside of, uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, in a place called Pocatello. Oh, cool. So I know you've been yes. working on a, a project in terms of, uh, bringing, you know, quality soil to farmers. And is that part of your trip? It is. Are you there right now? It yeah. Is. Okay. Yeah. What, I, what I'm doing is I'm basically stopping, um, I'm zigzagging across North and hopefully South America, uh, meeting with different farmers, different communities, seeing how they're tackling resilience in food. Right. And that's a big, big, uh, big thing to tackle for yourself. You know, so we, we should start with your story because people, the impact of what you've done is going to be start to be, it's going to be felt in the supply chain and food because you've been doing a lot of work sort of on, be under the radar. Uh, your forward facing company, Mod Garden, which you know allows people to grow food at home, allows people to take quality soil and sort of reintroduce into their life what we used to have generations ago. That's what people see, but what you're really doing in the background to sort of moonshot work, people don't know that that's coming from you, but let's start from where did you, why did this even happen? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, as far back as I can remember, probably even pre-teens, um, I used to suffer from headaches. And, you know, uh, the, nar the narrative back then is, oh, just take a pill or sleep it off. Um, but then as uh, the years wore on, the headaches continued to get worse. And they got so bad that by the time I was in university and working, um, I used to have to go to the emergency room to uh, get treated for migraine pain. And they used to, you know, pump me with Demerol and uh, I still wouldn't get any, re any relief. The pain was that debilitating. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, there were other, other things. It's not just one thing, right? If you have one um, issue in health, it's usually coupled with other things. And um, this other thing that I had was eczema. Again, it started off with uh, dry skin uh, in my pre-teens, in my adolescent years. And uh, by the time I was working, uh, you know, I used to pick up my briefcase and my palms would tear. The eczema oh, wow. was so bad. So it was really, really scaly and all that. So that, that really precipitated um, a need to understand, well, what's going on with me? 
only? Why am I the only? Well, mm -hmm. you know, in a matter of speaking, why are my colleagues, my family, not necessarily suffering as much as as much as I seem to be suffering? And so that preempted a uh, a project, call it a research project, call it you know, to understand well what is happening here. And was your family, your greater family, were they all? So you were in New York at the time, right? I was in England and New York, yeah. Or in England, so you split between the two. And that's where everybody else was also? Or was anyone up north and with us here in Toronto? Or? No, I have no, no family. Okay, so same environment, same exposures, but you had a different result. That's right. Wow, okay. So what did you change? Yeah, so um, it took a while. Uh, it probably took, this journey probably took like five or six years to figure out that, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you go to doctors, and the doctor says, yeah, I can, I can, a regular MD doctor. And the doctor says, yeah, I can make that eczema go away. Here, I can give you some dermatitis cream or whatever it is, or I can give you Imitrex. Um, that gave relief immediately, potentially, but um, it wasn't, it didn't solve the problem long-term. Right. It wasn't until I, I actually did come to Toronto, uh, that's when I started really looking into, and I met a few people who are naturopathic doctors who actually looked at the root cause of you know what's actually going on with you and what i understood in my mind was that something is misfiring in me and i have no idea what it is what is it that's misfiring inside of me that that you know, that needs to be fixed so i understood you know um from a from a instinct instinctive point of view what was happening with me but i didn't know what the answers were and so what I did was I, I started looking into supplements and I started taking supplements. And somebody said, you need to take 800 milligrams of magnesium per day as an adult male. And I'm like, okay. So I started taking those and then eventually the headaches did actually go away. And I'm like, what the heck is magnesium and all these <laughs> minerals that I'm taking? And where does it come from? And that began the journey of ultimately peeling away that onion layer of okay what is magnesium where does it you know where is this supplement coming from it's made in some manufacturing plant but what is magnesium ultimately it comes in some sort of some form of food or some form of mineral well what is a mineral and then you know as you go ultimately you end up at food so, and that yeah. One, yeah and 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 that's when that's when you're like thinking what it's in food well why am i not getting it why am i reacting differently because i seem to be eating really good food <laughs> I seem to be eating, you know, salads and all of that stuff. What is it that's happening with me? That's that's that's. So it's uh, what you thought was good, as where I mean, even walking into certain health sections of the grocery store, that's right. you 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 may think that what it is is good, but I think you took that and dove a little deeper. Like you said, that onion, you only got to layer two or three when you're in a certain, you know, a whole food section looking for whatever. But there's things beyond that that still needed work, and that's where your your story is phenomenal because. I mean, you went so far as to, you know, go to Dalhousie University and start working with them in terms of how is food even mean to how what is, what nutrition does the plant actually need, right? What what do we actually where do we start in terms of forget about what I'm buying at the grocery store? Let's take a few layers back, right? And my nutrition is one thing, but my nutrition comes from this living thing. What nutrition does it need? And that's what led you to that journey, which blew my mind when I heard about it. So tell us about the work you did with Dalhousie. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it comes down to, so all, after pull, pull, peeling away as many layers of the onion as possible in this research, what it came down to was soil. Right. Where is your food growing? So, you know, the answer is it's, it's food. Okay, well, what is food? You have to define food. Food isn't something that just comes into your stomach and then you, it just goes away. Food is actually extracted in your, in your body into the blood or circulatory superhighway, and then it gets absorbed into each one of our cells. And what is food? Uh, ultimately, it's minerals that get absorbed into each one of our cells. And I'm like, so I asked the question, well, what is absorption? Um, and that's really what the crux of food is, is uh, food, food is something that um, it's, it's a means to get minerals into your cells. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's a great tasting means of getting minerals into your cells. Now, the type of mineral, a magnesium in a pill form and a magnesium in broccoli form are gonna react in two very different ways. 
and it is going to react based on the soil that it's growing in. Mm -hmm. And so what led me to Dalhousie University was, uh, Dalhousie University of Agriculture, um, was my need to understand soil. And uh, what is the difference between a soil uh, that is treated with some sort of a mineralization, like a fertilizer, organic or not, or some sort of an input that is man-made, that is input into the soil that grows food. And so I wanted to understand that. And, and to me, again, my instinct told me that, that we don't really, for you know, pre-1890s, we didn't really intervene by inputting stuff into soil at all. Mm -hmm. Food kind of just grew in soil that was already rich. And it wasn't until like, you know, around the 1890s, that's when the research began with a person by the name of Albert Howard, uh, where we started, you know, they started experimenting with inputs like nitrogen fixation. Basically, what, what I mean by that is that they, they figured out that if you add nitrogen, extra nitrogen, which is normally breaking down, broken down by the plant through atmospheric, for, through, the, through the atmosphere, but if you add something extra, like a heroin shot of nitrogen into the soil, plants grow faster. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, during, that was the industrialization era. And so farmers were kind of being left behind. If you think of, if you think about that time, uh, while all the other you know, manufacturing and production um, was taking off. And I think uh, this began to experiment with soil and uh, trying to up the, the production of food so that they could make more money. And food ultimately over the last hundred years has become, has moved from grown from, uh, with love and care, which is, what, which is what it used to be grown as, to how can I maximize production and make it more commoditized, make it more available to everyone. So you, so you have and this industry that sort of yeah. cross paths with industrialization and had to catch up. Uh, demand obviously because of industrialization, industrialization uh, wealth increased, you know, people could buy more. Yeah. And so there was more demand. So the need to fulfill that demand was there. So then what is the harm in introducing the element that allows the plant to grow faster and have larger yields what is the potential risk or downfall it's uh it's almost uh I'll, I'll give you an example through an analogy um if you asked me for a glass of water if you if you said that you're thirsty um normally what you would do is you say i'm a glass of water and i want to drink and you'll sip the water when you need to sip the water but what if i give you a fire hose and i said here here's water right you may not die or but certainly you're going to you're gonna start feeling, you're gonna gulp and uh, you'll have these drowning um, feelings or whatever, waterboarding type, type, type feeling. Um, it'll create an imbalance. Your, your, your stomach will get full. You, know, you can imagine what will happen. Um, it's exactly the same thing that's happening in plants. What's happening with plants is that they figured out uh, the industry, the growing, the seed industry and the pharmaceutical industry that's growing our food, has figured out what makes plants grow faster, shinier, bigger, stronger, not necessarily healthier. Um, and that, when, when, when you add an input, like the fire hose analogy into the soil, it's gonna feed certain microbes. And there's millions and millions of species of microbes in the ground. If you only give it one type of input, such as nitrogen, it'll be at the sacrifice of other microbes that need other balanced diets. Mm -hmm. And if they're not getting their balanced diet, they're eventually gonna just die off. And the ones that are stronger, the nitrogen fixing uh, ones are gonna start to multiply and that's gonna create an imbalance. And I think we all know, I think your audience is smart enough to know that, you know, if you create an imbalance in your body, you eventually get sick. If you have, if you eat Twinkies all day long, that's going to give you maybe 2% of the nutrition requirements that you need, but that'll create an imbalance. And eventually it'll lead to perhaps not within months, maybe a couple of years, it'll lead to debilitating illness. You'll oh. get headaches, you'll get, you'll get sicker. That's exactly what's going on in, in the soil. The soil 
is being fed most commonly NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But soil is so much more. It is so much more. It's like our diets. You know, when we go out to eat, we eat broccoli, we'll eat meat, we'll eat so many different types of meats, we'll eat different types of lettuces. All of these varieties our body needs in order to be healthy. It's the same thing. A plant or a, a farm cannot just survive on three main minerals, NPK. It needs 20 to 30 of them at the request of the plant, like the sipping of the glass. The plant asks for atmospheric nitrogen when it needs it. It uses it, breaks it down, and then it sends it back out again. But we in the industry have figured out on the, on the, the Bayer is the biggest one uh, who makes fertilizers and pesticides. They figured out that, uh, you know, if we give them more uh, minerals or fertilizers, the plants will grow faster, but they haven't figured out what happens to the, to the plant after it grows and what its effect on the body is. Right. They're so just you... interested in producing the plant. Yeah, the outcome is make it bigger and faster, so we can sell more. But what what are you what are you actually consuming? And the, the parallel when you talked about the microbes, it's it's so directly comparable to what's happening with the human body today in the gut microbiome. The exact same thing is happening. Where because our foods are so sugar heavy, whether it's sweet or not, sugar is being used just as a preservative, right? And you wonder why so many people have all these undescribable or undiagnosable, you know, autoimmune type conditions that you can't really point your finger at it. Uh, when you're feeding the gut microbiome strains that feed off the sugar, just like you said about introducing one, two, three chemicals into the soil, and that's the bulk of the diet for the plant. Right? All of a sudden, whatever was required to use everything else is, is sort of dying off. And you have this plant that's using 10, 15% of its nutrition needs and that's what it becomes. The same thing is happening with the human body. The gut, because we're being fed in silos of sugar, salt, et cetera, sugar being the big one, that's what's flourishing in the gut, right? The gut microbiome strains that break that down. And what's exactly. then happening is then what's required to break down what you actually need is dying off. And you'll have all these imbalances. Why are all these people having gut issues, migraines, eczema, brain fog, like you yourself had? Because the yeah. gut isn't armed with what's required to actually break down what you need, you know, and it's a, it's a, so it's the exact parallel to what's going on in the soil. And this is, it would it's it's a logical and understood approach. If you remove what's needed, and it, just like you said with the water hose, all of a sudden I'm not getting what I need because my mouth's full of other stuff. Yeah, right, and I have no room for anything else. So yeah, exact exactly what we're seeing in terms of chronic disease. So then. When you, when you take these plants that have been through this process and they're, they're being offered up, are you, is there empirical measurable, hey, I have this cucumber in my hand and it does not have what we think it has in it. Meaning it's supposed to have this many calories, this many uh, grams of, you know, whatever, uh, mineral, vitamin, et cetera. Have we seen that measured out that the, the plant has changed? Yeah. Um, the, 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 it, it depends on who you're speaking with. Um, it's those rose, it's that rose colored glasses syndrome where the um, industrialists, the people who are industrially growing food, they're measuring the levels according to their measurements and they're cherry picking the minerals uh, and the levels of, they call it nutrients, but the levels of let's say magnesium uh, and they say, oh, we've got lots of magnesium and, and they measure something called bricks um, uh, it, it, carbohydrate levels, protein levels. Um, fine, you can measure the the levels of each of these minerals, but they're they're also not complete in the picture. They're they're not measuring polyphenols, for instance. So if you go to bionutrients.org, um, they've come out with another measurement, um, and I find that they're a little bit more um, correct. Uh, in terms of the breadth of what they're measuring. And they're, they're talking about uh, polyphenols. For instance, they say that you need 200 carats today 
for one that you ate 85 years ago or 100 years ago oh, wow. to get the same polyphenols uh, that you were that you got from one carrot. Um, so yeah, so so there's there's the breadth of the minerals that are you know they're 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 measuring the narrow the narrow band. You have to measure not only the breadth of it, not only the levels of of them, but also the broad spectrum. Are you getting the broad spectrum minerals? But beyond that, there's something else. There are minerals that are created when roots, root hairs and microbes interact with each other and they're created on the fly. And these are, uh, these are more commonly known as humates. You cannot, I mean, of course you can create humates and minerals synthetically in a lab, but I don't understand this concept of how you can get living a living plant from something that's synthetic coming into a living human being. It has to come from living to living to living right. in, order for, in order for us to be able to assimilate it within our body. And that is the crux of it. The crux of it is that it's coming from synthetics that is growing the plant. It may look like a plant, but you know, a brain dead patient may look alive, but is the brain dead patient really thriving and healthy? And the answer is obvious. The plant may look like a plant industrially grown, but is that plant healthy and thriving and living and, and good for us at the same time? So we have to, we, we really have to be very precise about our definitions about, you know, what's living. A plant, by definition, when you look at a plant, it looks like it's, it seems like it's living, but a brain dead patient also, by definition, is living. So, but is it, is it, um, is it vital? Does it have vitality? And uh, again, that needs a definition too. And these are, these are kind of new definitions that need a little bit more um, color and uh, a little bit more emphasis. So going back to this, what's the difference? When um, the, there, there, there are, and humates is just one example, the interaction of root hairs with microbes, certain microbes in the soil create byproduct minerals that enable absorption of minerals by the plant into the plant. Mm. Those same minerals, those humates come into the plant when we eat that plant, they go to work on our own bodies. And that is the key to assimilating the minerals into us at our cellular level. And that's what's missing from industrial right. perspective versus- uh, Yeah, it's not there to food. begin with. So you're, our, instead of uh, adjusting our outcome, we've adjusted the measure which to say, it's not that we have a poor outcome anymore. It's just that we're measuring for less. So what 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 do we agree right. on? You know, industrially wise, is a complete plant that's ready for sale. Is well, we only do this now. So as long as we've done that checkbox, right? The exactly. other things that used to happen. These I'm sure these terms most people haven't even heard of, right? How many times you pick up a, a, a box and say, "Let me look at the humate level." The measure is not even there because there's nothing to measure. That's right, exactly. Right, so right. just yeah, eliminate it as a, as an outcome and just stick to what you offer. But then all of a sudden you're offering an incomplete product. It's no longer a whole food, you know. And as you take for as an example, I was just speaking to someone about, uh, you know, why is it that Asians complain that when they talk to us, that we tell them you can't eat rice? They said no. My ancestors ate rice for generations, and we tell them genetically that no, they can't. And but we're not talking about their ability to break down or eat what their ancestors ate. We're talking about their ability to consume what's available in the store today, which is the inner white grain with the outer gran or bran, sorry, or hull removed, which is where all the fiber is, which is you know, the miracle of food. We are, we're being offered complete packaging, meaning that if you eat it with the bran, you then have the fiber to counteract the insulin spike, you know, the, the glycemic index that's so off the charts, just like a spoonful of sugar by eating a spoonful of rice, right? Uh, same thing with a, a parent we were talking to the other day that thought it was a good idea to be offering their child orange juice, right? So you would think you read the labels again, the, the checks that you're talking about, vitamin C, check, et cetera, et cetera, check, right? What's not being checked is when you drink the juice, 
you're getting yes to some vitamin C and you're getting 30 grams of sugar per, per cup. If you eat the fruit, you're also getting the fiber again that counteracts the sugar. Right. So it is a healthy food. You might as well be drinking a can of Coke in terms of the insulin spike and what it, what it does to you, right? So yeah, and so things are already complete. They were, like you said, 1890 prior to. Uh, so then what have you done in terms of your work with Dalhousie, with the soil to say here, now you've identified, here's what's going on. Here's, here's what caused my eczema, my scaly hands, right? What yeah. was it that you then did with the soil to bring it back to, hey, guess what? I'm healthy now. Uh, we've established in, in this talk that we need these byproduct minerals. We need a full spectrum of minerals um, um, in the soil and being created in the soil while the plant is interacting with the soil. So the plant is living in the soil structure. The plant rhizosphere is living in the soil structure and is interacting like a like a like a like a city, in, if you will. All these microbes have different jobs to do. Um, we, you know, when if you leave soil alone, if you go to, you know, people talk about the blue zones. The reason why people talk about the blue zones is because their soil is largely untouched. Mm -hmm. They go and they don't do any meaningful inputs. I don't think they uh, do any put any meaningful inputs into the soil, and the soil is grow the, the food is growing grown naturally. What we're trying to set up is. Um, you know, people who own farms, organic farms, you know, please keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's, it's, it's organic farms, biodynamic farms is a level better than that. No-till farming is usually part of that. Um, it's a very complex, it's a very complex subject. Um, but the simplest answer I can give you is we're trying to mimic the soil of an untouched farm. A, a, a truly organic farm. And, and even, you know, when I say the word organic, I almost hiccup or I, I almost, because the definition of organic is now owned by the FDA. It's just mm -hmm. a label. And there's, I think, 22 to 45 different synthetics that are allowed into the label organic allowed, uh, allowed within the confines of organic. Um, and now the Organic Consumers Association has come out with a new label it's called real organic, wow. um, which I would, which I would be more apt to trust. Uh, but then a level above that, again, we're, again, when when I'm speaking, we're speaking about large commercial um, productions of food. So you want to get as much organic as possible. If you can get real organic, I think that label that label just came out. So there's going to be very few foods to do to uh, to be able to you know, you, you won't find that many foods along those lines. Um, if, the, you know, the best way is to, you know, know your farmer. Um, so all, again, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to mimic the soils of your uh, back then so that they have the complete microbial population, probiotics population um, in the soil. Um, and we're putting it in a box. Um, again, we're not, we're, we're trying to solve the problem for cities. Right. With mil a million people or more. And uh, the, the trend today is that cities are just expanding. They're ever expansive. Um, and the casualty is the farm. The casualty is the local farmer. And that skill set is really dying. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to change that paradigm where we're trying to give city dwellers like ourselves a chance to eat real pure food. Uh, so because... how do you, so now I, I do remember when I ran into, I think it was at the home show and you had the mod garden set up there and you said, just, just taste this. Right. And I remember plucking, I think it was mint uh, and another herb. There was a couple of herbs and the flavor profile was unlike anything I'd ever experienced because it was real. So, and that taught me just for that flavor test that whatever I've been eating isn't the real thing. It's like you said, it's 30% of what it could possibly be because there's so many other minerals and other elements that were meant to be in there that leads to this whole plant. So we know that it can be done. We know that you've spent years now researching, getting the science nailed down. We know that you're down in Idaho teaching this community how to build a farm that's 
of this nature, how do you make that scalable when you're going up against, like you said, big food, you know, where it's the, the farming is being industrialized in order to supply the cities sustainably? What can you do to take, is it possible even to, to produce the soil like you're talking about where everybody starting with Toronto, for example, has the ability to eat the way you eat? How do you do that? Um, it's going to come down to one thing and one word democratically. We have to put food back into the hands of people again. So then you say, well, I live in the city and I'm, I'm strictly doing this with people who live in the city. How do I do it in the city? Community gardens. Actually, community gardens are great and all, but what I, in my research, I'm finding that people don't generally use them. Uh, they want more, con we're, we're now in a culture of convenience. And so um, when I say democ democratically, I've created an appliance, like let's call it the Keurig for fresh salads, if you will, um, that you put on your countertop and uh, you know, we'll send you the soil. You can't just go to your corner garden and scoop out soil because you have no idea what's in it. And right. you have no idea if it's complete. Does it have all the microbial population? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring health back. I'm trying to give people a fighting chance to be healthy at the lowest cost possible. We have a God-given right to be able to eat. Everybody does, whether you, no matter where you sit on the economic line, uh, to eat healthy food affordably. Um, and so th the only way that I know um, in my best uh estimate research you know the, what i've come up with is to put it back into the hands of people make them tiny farmers if you will it's right it's, a, it's something that we've um and let 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 us own food again we're not going to be able to fi fight the big four agrochemicals the, there's many there's many but the the largest four own 60 percent of seed global seed sales we're just not going to be able to economically fight that, uh, you know, one community at, um, at a time. We'll be able to fight it democratically if we own our own food production. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, embrace the fact that, you know, cities are getting larger. Millions and millions of people are migrating into cities. We can't, we're just, that, that's a trend that we're just not going to be able to change. What we, what, what we can change is what we have in our hands. Even going down to the, gro the organic grocery store, the organic farm, farmer's market and talking to the farmer, the local farmer, local organic farmer, they all claim that, oh, we have to add a little bit of fertilizer. We have to add a little bit of input. And there you have it, that's the break. And mm -hmm. so if you, if you don't want that break, you have to go to the source, get organic heirloom seeds, get the best soil, grow it yourself, and begin there. Yes, it's only a small percentage of your dinner plate, maybe 10, 12, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. Let's, let's get the basic nutrition into our bodies, and then we can build from there. And I know in terms of getting into cities, uh, you've been doing some work with some major real estate developers to say that the, in their plans, this should be so you have to normalize it, right? People have to understand that this is possible. Being a farmer, a tiny farmer, doesn't have to be overwhelming. It can be very easy uh, if they understood how easy you've made it for them. And even more going down that path, you're literally working with developers to make it part of, whether it's design, architecture, part of the, you know, the surroundings where it's, it's in your home. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we, used, we used to, uh, just, a, a, just a word on that, um, uh, we used to live in agrocentric societies, and now we've moved to metropolitan area, and I call them petropolises. Actually, um, uh, a German fellow, um, Herbert Gerard Day, if I got his name correctly, he's the one who coined that. So we used to live in agropolises 100 years ago or prior. We now live in petropolises, and that basically means that we take from these large cities, take from the outside earth. Right, and bring it in. Bring it in use it and then literally spit it out as waste right and the future paradigm has to be an ecopolis where we bring in minimum earth inputs use them up and re and, and and return a net positive back to the environment and so just thinking about that paradigm 
we've come up with our solutions to embody that where we use minimal inputs and we have a regenerative or a closed loop system where we make you farmers, but we also take your waste, whether it's the soil waste or your table scrap waste, food and paper, process it within an apartment building and then rejuvenate it and to be used by either farmers or you know us who, uh, to build more soil. Right. It and has to be closed loop. The, the the future the future the future has to be a net positive. Yeah, I think in, in, in a the lot of ways people are well socially. First of all, that's being forced now. People understand the damage we've done, and anywhere where it's possible, it's being promoted. Uh, it just hasn't been seen as possible here. Food waste is just it's a it's a known thing, especially in North America. It's it's given you. It's it's what happens, but it doesn't have to have to. Um, you know, going back to what you said earlier about living food and the importance of that, I don't, I, for the most part, when we talk to people as patients, they don't even realize that's a consideration. You know, they don't even realize that it's, but it's possible, like you said, the brain dead plant, it's literally you're, you're eating a corpse and there's something missing. And what is that thing missing? And I recall once listening to you speak and you were talking about biophotons and how even just that one thing you know, the signaling system and, and how, how much you should be taking in in terms of the light, the energy, the biophoton activity. And if you're eating a dead plant, it's not just, again, what we're measuring in terms of protein, carbs, vitamin A, B, C, D. There's other things we're meant to be getting from food that we don't even know about, we don't talk about because they don't exist anymore. Yeah. So in, can you uh, tell the audience about the work you, or the research you've done in biophotons? I found it mind blowing. I'm going to try and simplify this as much as possible and not get too sciencey here. Um, we, we, we are made up of light. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the communication that occurs between cells is through light or bio, at the, and, and the smallest light particle is a biophoton. Uh, we get light. So when you get sick, you know, you, 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 you're never glowing when you get sick, when you, when, when you, you, you almost always are drained and then you have to rejuvenate yourself back. And that's a kind of a tell, you know, just a, just a purely uh, face tell that, oh, this person's sick or this person is healthy. Right. If a person is healthy, they're generally glowing. Right. Now there's two main sources. So now you'll have to accept the statement. It's, it's a scientific fact, by the way that we're made up of light and we communicate with through biophoton activity between cells. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not just one cell to another. There's actually a shield around you where the cells are coming out of you and uh, each cell knows everything about the other cell. Each cell in your body knows ev all the information about every single cell, other cell in your body. So it's like instantaneously, like you get hit here. Instantaneously. The whole body knows. Instantaneously. Right. So if a cell, if if a cell is malfunctioning down in your leg, for instance, it might have cancer, your other cells will know and they'll react accordingly. So if given the chance, they'll there it's a healing process. But that's beyond the scope of this discussion. Now, um, when you get sick, you need to replenish yourself. Generally speaking, when you when you get sick, you know, if you eat good food, you get to replenish. So one source of biophotons is food. Right. The other obvious source of biophotons is the sun. When we go out, we come back with a glow. Mm -hmm. And it's not a tan glow, it's actually your body receiving these biophotons, and then, you know, we call it vitamin D, we call it, you know, a tan thing, but it's, that is, those are our two main sources. Uh, and I think biophotons may also exist in water, in good water. Now, if the food is, now, th th there's a lot of, there's a lot of sickness going around. Um, and there's a lot of chatter about vitamin D today. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the need to get vitamin D because we're not getting sun we're not getting the sun, especially in the Northeast. So now we're staying, we're staying indoors in the Northeast. The only other source of biophotons is food. A food that is genetically or synthetically treated does not have biophotons in it. Mm -hmm. 
the, the food that will have biophotons in it is food that is uh, produced through living organic matter, through living organisms such as you know, insect earthworms, the millions of microbes that are out there, they're harnessing that energy, that biophotonic energy, it's coming into the plant and it's showing up in taste. It's showing up in your body when it craves for it, being satiated when it receives even a little bit of a sunflower, one, one or two sunflower, you know, a, 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 a sprig of sunflowers, for instance, sunflower sprouts because your body is satiated with, with that. So it's with the minerals and the, and, and the completeness of the nutrition. So that's basically what um, the, a plant that is treated with pesticides, a plant that is, is sick. If I, if, I spray, if I spray Raid on your face, you're gonna get sick because of all the chemicals. There are untold chemicals in Roundup. The chemical, the, the chemical that's used, uh, that's a main pesticide ingredient that's used uh, by Monsanto and plants are getting sick. Mm -hmm. And so if 99% of our soils, which is the case in America, 99.3% of our soils are treated with this pesticide, about in excess of 97% is uh, of Canadian soil, Canadian plants are treated with this pesticide. And then we don't, we don't want to, I don't even want to trust the statistics, statistics that are coming out of India and China, where a, another majority of our food is coming from, you know? Our, so our food is basically being treated with this pesticide, which is killing the plants or making them extremely sick. And that biophotonic activity is low and that's making us sick in turn. That's another cog in the wheel of why we're getting sick. It goes back to, you know, if we round sort of summarize it down to people don't even know why they eat, right? The, the thinking behind food is fat, carbs, protein, some vitamins, minerals. There's so much more to food that we've lost uh, because of how we don't grow it. So we, the problem was there. There's more demand, more people, we need more food. That's true. Exactly. The solution may be not the best path because we didn't actually understand when we say we need more food, what does food even mean? Does it mean just feeling full, right? How much did we give up in the in the decisions we made in terms of how do we ramp up and scale up food production? One simple thing, biophoton activity, you no longer, the life that you're meant to be getting from this plant that's signaling that your cells require in order to communicate and be the best yourself. Why all of a sudden do we feel dull up here? Why all of a sudden does everything hurt? Why all of a sudden are there joint pains? You know, the, the system, like you said, it's an overall system failure. There's no single thing you can point your finger at. And that by the time you're 50, 55, turns into a chronic disease, you know, and then we know where that goes from there. So yeah, and it's another thing to just keep asking. And it, it shows you, you need to explore. Like what you think you have in front of you may not be the complete answer, regardless of what you're looking at, right? And a simple thing in terms of, okay, here's food. Here's what the label says. And here's the sort of structure, the bubble within, I think, of food. And there's so much more that I didn't even know I needed to ask. I didn't know that those, those exactly. measurements existed, right? And this is where it's very important for people like yourself to keep exploring and keep learning and keep teaching also, which you've done amazingly. So in terms of uh, mod garden and the soil, how do people access it? How do people, if they want to start doing this or experimenting or working with you, how do they get involved? Um, well, you know, as you know, we're, we're in, we're a startup, uh, company. Um, so on one hand, I'm trying to launch a solution where we give people a convenient way to be able to grow their own food. Um, I'm on a journey right now where, uh, I think it boils down to resilience. If, if I were to boil it down to one word, I would say resilience. I think all those things that we take for granted granted flicking on a electrical uh, a switch to turn the light on uh, opening the tap and water comes out walking to a grocery store and there's abundance of food i'm beginning to question all of that mm -hmm. and yes um i already question it with the abundance of or the lack of nutrients in the plants and i've come up with mod garden as a solution that I would like to introduce to mankind 
uh, globally, but I'm beginning to question things even more. You know, are the things that we take for granted always going to be there? And so what I'm setting on a journey of not only to understand food outside of cities, but also understanding how people are being resilient with electricity, how people are being resilient with clean water, because it all, they all play together. We can't look at the, the problem with today is that we've become in, in the globe and in education is that we myopically look at just single verticals. Mm -hmm. We fail to look at the, the connected picture, the networked global ecosystems interacting with the biological ecosystems, interacting with the human biological systems, um, interacting with even the solar system. But biodynamic farming has an aspect of the solar system involved with it. And that's what we're missing in this era of having stuff more convenient, faster, bigger, better, quote unquote. Yeah, you lose the um, functional approach, meaning in every big silo, the ones that you're talking about that you know point to health and wellness, you're going from training to functional training. You're going from medicine to functional medicine. You're going from diet to functional diet plans because all of a sudden we're realizing that it's not... You can't put me in a siloed bucket and expect an outcome. You know, I can't just look at one thing at a time. I can't say, okay, let's fix your heart. But meanwhile, there's toxicity flowing through your blood every, any other, every other direction. If you're not looking at the whole picture and understanding how everything interacts, you're only solving one and you'll always just be playing catch up because one thing attacks the other. Catch up. Yeah. Always catch up. Yeah. And the, so that yeah. functional approach is coming out in every direction, in every industry. Uh, and is being led with people with problems. People with problems are saying, I haven't had my problem resolved. And so I need a better solution. And that's what's driving this sort of the, the, yeah. the motivation behind everyone that's pioneering this stuff. So, so I have to thank you for joining us. I know your time is valuable. You're camped out in Idaho and, you know, working with these, uh, with the farmers out there to get set up. And meanwhile, you've taken some time away to be able to speak to us and share your knowledge um thank you again to, it was awesome i hope everybody benefits from this knowledge because they truly if it comes down to one thing you could do to affect your health outcomes you're doing it anyway you're already eating just change the way you eat yeah. that's a, the easiest exactly. thing you could do to yeah. have a massive impact on your health so with 100%. that yeah with that thanks again for joining us today thank you you're welcome